Welcome to the Financial Advisor Success Podcast, where you go behind the scenes with financial planner, speaker, and consultant Michael Kitsis to hear stories of how leading financial advisors navigated the inevitable challenges that arise on the path to success and get insight from leading industry consultants about how to break through to the next level in your advisory business. And now here's your host, Michael Kitsis. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the 366th episode of the Financial Advisor Success Podcast. My guest on today's podcast is Stephen Gwynnum. Stephen is the founder of Grow Wealthy, spelled W-E-L-L-T-H-Y, a health and wellness consulting firm based in Springfield, Missouri, that specializes in working with busy, but not always healthy, financial advisors. What's unique about Stephen, though, is how she combines her family roots in the financial advice business with her decades-long career in well-being and health as a coach to financial advisors, particularly to address what she calls the big swap, where we start our careers being younger and healthier, but with very little income, and then grow the point where we're financially successful, but often at a cost of swapping out our health a trend that Stephen is trying to reverse given how it impacts not only an advisor's quality of life, but ironically also our finances and impacting when we have to retire or not. In this episode, we talk in depth about how Stephen sees the current state of the union when it comes to financial advisor health and how in providing for others, advisors often forget ourselves, leading to long hours and high stress, especially when coupled with the demands of life ranging from scaling businesses to building families. How although Stephen often sees the focus of financial well-being take precedence in the preparation for retirement, in reality, she views both financial wealth and physical wealth as necessary for advisors and our clients to have success and freedom in our later years. And how Stephen utilizes the way that financial advisors are already wired around metrics and goals and data to visualize and optimize helping them find the metrics and measurements that cumulatively affect their wealth. We also talk about how Stephen's first introduction to the financial advisor industry actually pushed her away from it as she watched her father and many of his colleagues achieve their financial success that set them up well for retirement, but without maintaining their holistic health that would have allowed them to truly enjoy the golden years. How Stephen's own near-death experience in Australia caused her to recalibrate her own metrics and definitions of health, as well as sparked a pivot in focusing on financial advisors in particular. And how Stephen has leveraged the language and terms that we as financial advisors often use to speak about financial wellness, from using bad debt to frame up concepts of sugar and sleep and other high health hazards, and help motivate advisors into action. And be certain to listen to the end, where Stephen shares how she saw her own metrics of health slip when building and scaling her business, which in turn made her realize she didn't have to do it all and outsource and reprioritize parts of her own business. Why Stephen believes that the first step to wellness comes from confronting and overcoming one's own procrastination and belief in future self and by aiming for more incremental natural changes focused around rest and movement rather than the traditional approach of diet and exercise. And why Stephen views wellness not as a top-down process of science to behavior, but as a curiosity-driven journey between best practices, one's own inclinations, and finding behaviors and habits that we can comfortably sustain. And so with that introduction, I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Financial Advisor Success Podcast with Stephen Gwynnett. Welcome, Stephen Gwynnett, to the Financial Advisor Success Podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Michael. I, I really appreciate you joining us and 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 coming out for a conversation today that I, I think will maybe be a, li- a little bit different than some of the themes that we we cover in other other episodes of of this podcast. You know, one, one of the questions that we've long asked at the end of every episode of the podcast is around how advisors define success for themselves. And, and I'm always fascinated that, I mean, like we're, we're in the money business as it were, and basically no, no one defines their success and goals by, by money. Um, like we have it, we're, most of us are reasonably good at accumulating it over time, but at, at best it's like the, 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 the means to some ends. Usually it's something in the fact like money buys us autonomy with our time to then do the things we actually want to do with our time. And and for most advisors, I find like it falls into a couple of buckets. Like some of us, that's really about time for relationships that might be family relationships, that might be client relationships, might be team relationships, but there's there's something in that human human con- relationship connection. Often something crops up around kind of impact legacy what I leave behind, how I impact the world, even if I'm not here anymore. And then 
there's often something that comes up around health, right? Like just being able to do those things <laughs> that we want to do around uh, relationships and impact and, and, and be able to do them as, as, as long as we possibly can. And you know, we, we talk about that, but I find in practice for love advisors, we talk about growing relationships and often we do invest in relationships as kind of the, the business of, of advice with, with clients. We talk about legacy and impact and a lot of us really do build towards legacy and impact. And then a lot of us talk about health and our time and energy and resources are not always actually lined up on that one. <laughs> we say, I find it's the one that we we say the most, and I don't want to say do the least, but I have the biggest gap between how often we talk about it, what we actually do about that. And I know that this is a directly like the domain in which you have built a business working with advisors around like our, our own health and wellness. And so I'm just, I'm excited to have the conversation today about is like what that works looks like and how we improve it. And, and I guess it's even at a more fundamental level, like why are we so good about talking about relationships and improving relationships and talking about legacy impact, improving legacy impact and talking about our health and then not really taking the steps to improve our health. Well, you've seen so many advisors now doing this. Like, where do you think the gap comes from? Why is this such an issue in the first place? You know, that's that's so 30,000 foot viewish. And I absolutely love the concept here of why. Why does this frustration exist? Because that's really what it is. Everybody wants to be healthy. Everybody wants to have great relationships. They want to have great businesses, legacy, all of that. Um, and, I mean, and when, we're, we're wired for survival. Like it's a human thing. Like we really, really, right. really don't like dying. Right. So why is this so hard? Well, I, I've interviewed 507 advisors and asked them this question. And, and what is your health? What do you wish it would be? And why do you feel like you're not there? And for each person, I'm going to say that it's it's probably a different tweak on the same answer, which is experience. From the day that they're born, their health has been pretty good, most people, right? They're not born with no health. You're born right. with no money. You build your relationships. You don't build your health. Your health comes in with you, and then it slowly declines over time. So you think... Just logically, what I've always had will always be. And it's, it's, it's not true. And so they never had to work for it. They never had to build it. They never had to do what they had to do with these other pieces of their lives. So that's, that's my guess is that they just kind of like, well, I've always had my health. I'm sure it'll be here tomorrow too. So I'll just keep doing what I'm doing and don't realize that's, what's sneaking up on them. That's an interesting framing. Like just that, that does resonate to me, right? That, you know, just when I hear, I mean, some of us say this, right? Like, I, I want to get better on my uh, about my health, but like, I don't quite have the time or the desire or the motivation. Like, I just can't quite get there. And I, I, I hear that, and just sort of the the word that comes to mind is complacency. Like, mm -hmm. I know I should do something about this, but I'm just kind of complacent about where where I am in practice and whether I really really need to do something now about it. <laughs> right. And and you have such a good point, right? Just at the, the most basic level, like uh, most of us, at least, like we're born with pretty good health and no money. So we spend most of our time trying to build up the money part while we take the health part for granted. Right. Uh, until at some point you reach a certain age and stage of life and or career where suddenly the money part isn't the problem and the health part is not as strong as it used to be. And maybe we are realizing that. Uh, we can't quite take it for granted the way that we did in the past and and the priorities change. Absolutely. They change for two reasons. Mid-career, when the hustle years are kind of done, maybe scaling is a little bit done. You're still in business. You still want to be in business, but you've got more room to be like, okay, now I can look around and say, okay, there's some stuff I've been slacking on. Like that's one reason I see people. The other is a health event and that's more common. It's like, oh, my, my A1C is high and my doctor wants to put me on medication or uh, a low dose of blood pressure medication. What, like, what happened? When did this happen? 
And mm-hmm. it's a wake up to go, ooh, I've, I've accumulated more health debt here than I realized I had accumulated. And then they start to realize they've got limited time now to pay that off and get into a, a healthier space. I like I like the financial advisor tone here, right? We've accumulated <laughs> health debt that's going to be expensive to pay off. I love it. Yes. I love it. <laughs> oh, Michael, I've got analogies galore. If we talk long enough, you might hear all of them. That's fantastic. But again, like I, I think from an advisor end, it's like that resonates. <laughs> that that resonates with me, right? Like I've I've got this small debt that's accumulating on the side that I haven't really been paying attention to that kind of compounds at a not so favorable interest rate. And if you ignore it too long and let it compound too long, that's going to be a really, really painful debt to pay off at some point. You know, I liken it to saving for retirement. If you start in your thirties, it's pretty easy, but if you don't wait, don't start until you're 60, it's, it's hard and you have to do a Mm. lot of drastic changes. It's exactly the same for your health. If you wait too long, it becomes really difficult and not super fun. So that's what we're trying to do is get ahead of that and help people make small deposits. I just did a talk recently on it called the, the health 401k. How can you automate these small deposits so that your health is not bankrupt by the time you get to retirement? doesn't matter how much money you have. And, and, and you can even go further and say it's risk tolerance. When you're young and your thirties, you can eat the pizza and stay up all night long and you can be stressed out of your mind and, and work 16 hour days for weeks on end because you have a lot of margin and your body recovers well. But when you get to be 50 or 60, your, your risk tolerance is much lower and you don't have that margin and you have to, you have to just tune it in a little bit more. So, so tell us a little bit more about this kind of interviewing and surveying you were doing around, I think you said you were asking advisor, like, what, what is your health? What do you wish it to be? Why is it not there? So I don't know, maybe just like st- state of the union, I'm sort of vision, like state of the, state of the advisor health. I mean, w- sure. what did you find? I'm going to assume there, there are a decent check, like as advisors, we are really goal oriented people. Uh, in fact, we, 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 one of our well-being research studies uh, that we do on the Kitsis platform kind of like profiles advisors on a lot of different dimensions of m- just sort of like motivations and, and, and personality styles. And one of the things that we found we weren't looking for, but it kind of showed up was uh, advisors as a group are just off the charts, goal oriented people. Like mm-hmm. the average advisor is three standard deviations off from the general public oh. in orientation towards goal accomplishment. Wow. Uh, and we're like two standard deviations off in self efficacy, which means like we're super goal oriented and really confident in being able to achieve them, which just <laughs> makes you, which just makes you even more goal oriented because right. you're goal oriented and you're good at checking your goals off, which means you try to make more goals. So right. a lot of us, I think, like, we are pretty good about health, either because we're mindful of it in the first place, or we have one of the events you talked about. We set a new goal, and darn it, we're goal achieving machines. So, mm-hmm. like, we figure out how to get there. But what do you find overall? Like, how many of us are in a good place? How many of us are in not such a good place? Uh, where where do you find the gaps as you've been doing all this interviewing and research directly to advisors? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. I'll just give you a few of the, the big takeaways. One of them is um, I always assess stress and it's perceived stress, how stressed they particularly feel. And we didn't measure it on, you know, any kind of data stat um, input, but this was their take on their own stress. And it was a scale of one to 10. And of all the people I interviewed, the average advisor stress is a seven out of 10, which is, is a chronic moderate stress all the time. Sometimes it goes higher, but it rarely goes lower, but they kind of see themselves at a seven when things aren't going crazy. And where we see good health, repair, restorativeness, feeling good about what you're doing, and the ability to stay long-term in the industry is when your stress is a five or less on that same scale. And so as an as a group, having them be at a seven just shows that there's constant adrenaline and cortisol coursing through their blood, which is helping them to change their body composition in a negative way. It's helping them put on fat. It's helping them um, 
get lesions inside of their arteries. It's health, it's blood pressure. All kinds of negative effects are happening simply because of that stress level. And when I did the research on it, Michael, I found out that there were some surveys done in this industry. And they said that the, the, the stress in 2008 when the housing bubble happened, right now, the stress in this industry is 30% higher than it was then. And I think what it is is a case of people thinking it's okay, it's normal, it's, it's standard to be that stressed. And they're not realizing the damage that it's doing. So that's, that was an aha moment is that this group is very stressed, right? And, and well, and. I will say we see a parallel to it. We just um, we just finished uh, running our advisor well being research study, so we do it on the on the Kitsis platform every every other year. So the last one was in twenty twenty one, and and we we just wrapped up and published the uh, the the twenty twenty three study, and and what we found was a really notable decline in average advisor well being over the past two years mm. across basically every single age group and demographic we we measured except advisors in their uh uh over age 55 to 65 like o- older advisors by and large uh were similar or slightly happier right tends to be in a good place for their business overall and we're still pretty happy with where their businesses were right that makes and so every sense. other group was worse and we were really surprised we were like we feel this in 2021, like right between the spikes of of the uh, COVID variant waves, mm-hmm. which by most people's measures, like a really stressful <laughs> time. Like right. you're back in the office, you're not back in the office, you're meeting with clients again. Nope, we're back on Zoom again. <laughs> like so much stuff was in flux all over the place. Mm-hmm. And so we were expecting just to see this like post-COVID bounce in advisor well-being. And instead, every category was lower. Except wow, advisors age fifty five to sixty five, right. who apparently are feeling pretty good where they are. At right, this stage. right. Well, that's what I found too. I found that everyone is le- dealing with a, a chronic stress, and and you know, just from a physiological standpoint, when you combine chronic stress with chronic sedentariness, that means periods of long bouts of not moving out of your chair. Um, many advisors are, are chained to their chair for many hours at a time. Um, it's what I call a toxic cocktail for chronic disease. One plus one equals 50. So if you have both of those present, you're exasper- exacerbating the issue as far as chronic disease goes. And so that's that's a health crisis in the industry is what we're seeing. Um, So that was number one. Number two is that when I looked at the healthiest people that I spoke to who gave themselves, uh, their stress was directly related to their health. So if they scored themselves high on health, they scored themselves low on stress. There was a converse relationship or an inverse relationship. And that was really interesting. So are their stressors actually different or are they just better able to cope is the question. And, mm. and I think that there's an interesting thing there. So if you, if you take better care of your health, then your ability to bounce back and not feel as stressed might not be as, as big of a deal. And so that was not, that was another interesting piece. Um, I also found the people who are most, um, healthy were spending or allocating 10% of their day to their health. So what does 10% of the day mean? Okay, if we've got 24 hours, eight hours, we're going to just knock them off the top for sleep. That's what mm-hmm. we should be doing. So we're left with 16 hours of week time. The average middle-aged American sits still for 12.3 hours per day. You're like, okay, that's leading us to high levels of chronic disease. Um, so the research says if you change that by an hour or two, just kind of inner intermix different, you know, modalities of movement, whether it's walking to the water cooler or walking and talking or going for a walk outside, doesn't matter. Um, You can actually reduce all cause mortality and chronic disease incident. So what I found similarly in the group of people that I interviewed is that if they spent 10% of their wake hours on themselves, they were healthier. So that's like an hour and a half, roughly. And so an hour and a half every day, every day. And it doesn't matter if it was preparing their food for lunch or if it was taking a walk or if it was getting a massage. Like I didn't really see any okay. commonality. So not, not necessarily 
like an hour and a half a day of exercising no, necessarily. No. It might even be a rest. It might, it, it could be something very simple or something engaging like CrossFit. Like it, it didn't matter. I didn't see any, like it had to be a specific thing, but it was just that they were intentional and, and depositing back into themselves in some format. And I would actually not recognize, rec- recommend that much exercise. And I can say that wholeheartedly because I have a master's degree in exercise physiology and I spent 20 years trying to get people to exercise. So I come by this recommendation fully well aware of the benefits of exercise. And I, I teach something called the hierarchy of wealth and it's a pyramid with four levels. And on the bottom level is how you think, mind. On the next level, and you start at the bottom and you work your way up. And the next level is mending. How do you recover yourself? The next level from that is meals. How do you feed and nourish your body? And the very tip, the last thing is exercise. And if you start with exercise, you're going to burn out, get injured, or quit. Like it's just not going to work. If you start with diet and exercise, it's not going to work. I know this for for many decades and hundreds of clients that if you start there, you will not succeed long-term. So what is what does it mean? It means you take something from each category. So what are you doing to improve your, your thinking? How are you orchestrating your day? How are you preparing your food or going to the grocery store and making room for you to take a, a five-minute siesta at three o'clock or going for a walk after, after lunch or uh, – I don't know, playing with the dog on the floor because getting down on the floor and back up off the floor is a big deal. I know it doesn't seem like it, but it's a big deal. And I, until you get older and it's a lot harder to get off that floor than it used to be. uh, Yeah, that's true. But if anybody who's listening has watched Live to 100, it's the docuseries on the Blue Zones on Netflix. Um, he went to Okinawa, Japan, the guy, uh, Dan Butner, who wrote that book, Blue Zones, and he looked at these 90, 100-year-old people. They're getting down and up off the floor an average of 30 times a day. And so you're like, okay, this, there's, there's so many things we can do besides just go to the gym or exercise. And I would say that sometimes less is more when it comes to people who have a lot of stress and who are dealing with a lot of busyness or raising kids or caring for loved ones or whatever that might include. Michael, financial advisors are some of the most caring people I have ever met. And I can say this wholeheartedly because my dad was one for 32 years. He took, was a financial advisor. He was a financial advisor for 32 years, yes. And he took care of people. He served them. He he gave of himself to these people, was a part of his community, was engaged at all these different levels. And that takes a lot. And if you if you take and or excuse me, if, if you continue to listlessly give and give and give to everyone around you, sometimes you don't need to go run three miles or lift heavy weights. Sometimes you need to go take a bath, get a massage, put your feet up the wall, go for a walk with the sunset, breathing out of your nose. Um, Sometimes you need to just do the monotony of chopping onions because it's therapeutic and it's preparing for your next meal. Like all of these things that I'm talking about this hour and a half, this 10% of your waking waking days is like um, the stuff that just feeds you on those four levels that I just mentioned. So my four levels again, m- mind, mending, meals, exercise. And movement, yep. And movement. Oh, because they're all Yes, M's. they're all M's, of course, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, so you talked about mind. I think we get movement. Um, can you share a little bit more around meals? I think I know what that means, but like what yeah. – Meals yeah. and and what it, what is mending in this framework? Yeah, well, we'll start at the bottom. We'll start with the mend one, which is where everybody that I work with ignores because they they they're like, yeah, I should get more sleep. But there's almost this badge of like, I only got four hours of sleep and I'm still able to be here doing this, or I'm so busy, and it's 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 something to look out for. So we start there and we're like, we look at metrics and we say, okay, how long are you sleeping? What time are you going to bed? Because it does matter. You have to have deep sleep and REM sleep. Deep sleep happens in the first half of the night. REM sleep happens in the second half of the night. For the most part, I know there's cycles and there's lots of detail there, but for the most part, if you're going to bed too late, you're not getting deep sleep, you're not repairing your cells. And 
You're not repairing your brain. So you're at risk for dementias and slowing down in older age. Nobody wants that. So like sleep is, is we hear it all the time. And it's something where it's something where we are trying to understand how do we protect that space? How do we get the, um, the different levels of sleep, but then how do we also get to bed before midnight so that we can get the deep sleep that we need? You would not believe how many advisors have a second work day. Maybe you would. You probably do know that. They have a second work day and they work all day. They, they do dinner or whatever, and then they go back to their computers at night, destroying their circadian rhythm with the blue light, destroying their deep sleep and reparative. So they're actually going into further debt and waking up not recovered. They haven't paid their debts for the night. So they're in a sleep debt the next day. So that that's one pillar. The other pillar is what we already talked about, which is stress. They don't know their stress. So we have to look at things like heart rate variability and resting heart rate and breathing rate while they're sleeping and things like that so that we can be like, I know you don't feel stressed, but your body is stressed. How can we fix that? You said that advisors are goal-oriented. They absolutely are. I have a one-page scorecard. I call it the longevity metrics. We fill it out together. These are all the things that I have discovered that lead to longevity, being able to do what they want, when they want, with the people they want, for as long as they want. Because it's not fun to get kicked out of your business because your health doesn't hold up and you have to sell it or, or you know, bring somebody in or whatever before you're ready. So that's what MEND is all about, is those two pillars of stress and sleep. And 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 just the measuring that you're talking about, I'm assuming this is our, our modern age of Fitbits and the like that you can just strap on the equipment and it actually tracks all this stuff for you. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It does. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. We, we use Fitbits or Apple watches or aura rings or whoops or whatever. It doesn't matter. We can, we can get the data from everything, but it's just, it's like pulling the curtain back and getting to look inside at your physiology. Is it perfect? No, but it's good enough for us to see trends on things. And when people understand that their heart rate variability tanks when they don't get enough sleep and then their heart rate variability goes up. It means that their their nervous system is balanced and working properly. And they understand how that relates to brain fog and making better decisions and having not having a, a fight with your wife or husband or whatever. Like it's 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 eye opening. And you're like, oh, I'm doing these little things that are making life harder for me. <laughs> Why don't I not do that? And then life will get easier. I call it the fertilizer of life. It everything grows better when you're taking care of your your mend level. And just for for nerding out a moment for those who aren't familiar like what is HRV? Sorry, yes. Um that I just did a huge blender that people in the industry do all the time talking about RIAs and things. But yes, HRV no, really? is heart rate variability. And um, I'll, I'll nerd here for a minute so people understand you want your HRV, your heart rate variability to be very high. And it's what it's measuring is every beat of your heart. And it's measuring the time in milliseconds between each beat of your heart. Logically, you'd think, well, we want those beats to be pretty consistent, right? Well, we don't actually, because one nervous system, one one side of your nervous system is your sympathetic fight or flight nervous system is saying, beat, 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 beat. And it's wanting your heart to beat faster and faster because you've got so much to do. But you've got this other side, which is the off switch. And that's your parasympathetic nervous system is saying, you're fine. Calm down. It's okay. Breathe. Slow down. And when they're both talking to your system, then your heart has variability between its beats because one's saying speed up and one's saying you're fine and everybody's engaged. And that's a good sign. So there's a lot of variability. You're, you're, you're doing well. If, you're, if you have a very low heart rate variability, it means that you are in fight or flight all the time and you, you don't know how to turn it off or to repair and recover your system. And it's, you know, I have clients all the time that they have no variability at all. And we start working on a few tweaks and we don't, we don't overhaul things. I'm all about high ROI, high return on investment, a little bit of effort and resource for a big outcome. And so we find the piece, the gap that's going to move the, the needle the most. And for everybody, it's different, but we, that's what we look for. We find, we find the gap, we get the tool, we fix it, and the domino pieces fall into place. And 
that's the beauty of tech. And then the, also the beauty of being able to see what the tech means and say, there's the gap, let's fix that. And let's fix it in a way that feels good to you. So it doesn't feel like you're punishing yourself or guilty if you don't do it. And, you know, someone loses 25 pounds, they're like, I feel like I haven't done anything. It's been too easy. I'm like, exactly. That's how it should feel. It should feel natural and part of who you are. We just have to find that thing for you. And then talk to us about the the meals yeah. layer of the of the pillar. So for meals, I have a new take on the CFP designation, and it's called okay. carbs, fats, and proteins. So carbs, fats, and proteins CFP have to be. You have to have this designation. You have to know the stuff that it takes to get those balanced. And I'm going to I'm going to share a little bit of my philosophy with you. I am I am what's called diet diet agnostic. So if I don't, I don't subscribe to any particular type of diet. The one that I tell people who don't have a particular bent in a certain way is just be balanced, just balance. And inside my portal, I've got this app portal that my clients all use when they enter their food in, we do an audit of their food, right? And we watch it and we just change a few things based on what we see. They don't have to do that forever, but there's this beautiful little wheel in there and it's balanced. So they've got these CFPs, carbs, fats, and proteins. And if they're equal, you're probably doing okay. We don't eliminate anything. So we, we just look at, can we put a few metrics around this? And, and people can self-assess and then they can make a decision that's going to help them balance their macros over time. I don't care about calories, Michael. I, I care about nutrients. And if you get the nutrients right, the calories work themselves out. So what we do is we take all of these things that we want to do and we put them on a clock. And it's called circadian, around the clock. It's, it's uh, where cir- the, the word circadian rhythm comes from. And we do these things in the first hour they're awake that are going to set their clock. And then we do things at their meal, during their work, and um, their last hour that they're awake that are going to support their physiology in very, very small ways. And it gets this cadence going where the body can predict. It, it's all the clocks inside the system are on track with each other. They're synced. And this this beautiful symphony begin, of health begins to form. And it's it's so much easier than people think. How so I, I haven't heard a lot of discussion around things like first hour, last hour activities. You know, I feel like there, there's a lot out there about diet and the meals and what we do in between. Uh, but talk to us a little bit more about just what you're framing up here around first hour, or last hour. Yes. Yeah, so first hour and last hour are your most important hours. Um it's, and it's not because you're going to go to the gym or anything like that, but that's setting the tone for the rest, for what comes next. So your first hour you're awake, you need to do things to wind up your physiology, to turn all the switches on, glucose uptake, oxygen uptake, you know, you're, you've got this optic nerve that runs to a central clock in the middle of your brain. And if you don't see light within the first hour, like sunlight would be best and daylight is second best, then you don't, you don't set your clock and then you're up, you're up till two o'clock in the morning, can't sleep or can't get into deep sleep. So what you do in the morning, I call it echo because an echo reverberates all day long. So I tell, tell my clients in the morning, you first E, you eliminate, go to the bathroom. Then you see, you calculate what metrics are important to you. Do you need to step on the scale or check your blood sugar or whatever, like whatever those measures are, blood pressure, calculate that stuff right then. And then H is hydrate, get 16 ounces of water because you've probably lost two pounds of water while you're sleeping. That turns all your systems on. And then O is most important and that's orchestrate. So orchestrate your day. What do I have going on today? When am I going to eat? And when am I going to move? If I'm not going to move now, when is it going to be? And do something to just set the intention for the day. So that first hour is critical for how the rest of the day goes. That makes sense? It makes sense. So then the, the last hour, 
You're yes. like the wind down, right? Like you have to just ramp back down so your body knows it's time to produce melatonin. It's time to get ready for turning off all the systems of hunger and digestion and all of that. It's time to start repairing and using fat as a fuel source so that you're not accumulating, but you're actually managing your weight. And And that last hour is turning down the lights, turning off the blue lights, um, making sure that you're not working too late and keeping the the neurotransmitters on in your brain that are causing you to not be able to get into deep sleep. And so there's lots of things that you can do in that space. But um, that last hour is just important because it dictates what your morning is going to be like as well. Okay. So you mentioned earlier a a one-page scorecard around this as well. So what what do you because we love our goals and our <laughs> metrics tracking. So like what, yeah. what do you what do you score and track or like what should we be collectively scoring and tracking for ourselves? Yeah, so um, there are um, five areas on this scorecard. One of them is called biometrics. It's height, weight, body fat. You know, if you don't have a Renfo scale or some body composition scale, I would recommend getting that just so you can see because people lose muscle as they age naturally, six to 14% a year after age 40 and we don't Wait, what, what was the tool you recommend the, uh, a renfo yeah the, it's it's a cheap it's an inexpensive affordable body composition scale you can get on amazon for 25 dollars, and it has these electrodes you stand on it and it reads your body fat your muscle mass uh, visceral fat which is around your organs and it gives you some baseline numbers and then you can watch over time how those change so that you are not losing muscle mass and so that you're not accumulating what I consider to be a credit card debt, which is visceral or belly fat, because it has a very high interest rate. It's, it's very costly to you to have that. And so you can use a simple tool like that to just keep an eye on those things. Okay. Yeah. So biometrics. Biometrics is first. The next one is blood work. And I have a list of 13 things I think everybody should get. And then the last two are your move metrics and your your um, meal metrics. And those are things like how much protein should you be getting a day? How much are you getting a day? Are you meeting your goals as far as fiber intake? Everyone's too low on fiber. Um, we, have, we watch something in, in move movement called zone minutes, like how much time are you getting in a specific heart rate zone? And his recommendation is 150 to 300 minutes in a particular zone. Most people are at like 20 for, for the, the whole week. And we want it to be 150 to 300. So, so for advisors who are, are listening, like where do we get started? There's, You've, we've, we're talking like a lot of stuff now. So now, now they're like, <laughs> this all sounds awesome, which means now it's so much to do. I can't do anything because I'm, I'm overwhelmed because it's so many awesome things. Yeah. Yeah. So where, where do we get started? Right. As, as you noted earlier, like you, you like to aim for the, the bigger ROI activities. So yeah. what tends to be the big ROI activities that, that we could be pursuing? Well, if you if you don't mind, I'd like to take a step back to frame it a little bit. If you if sure. you're good with that, um, the first place to start is understanding um, the big swap. That's what I'm going to call it. And this is what an advisor said to me. He said, "Stephen, I came into this industry with no money and as an athlete, and now 40 years later, I have a ton of money and I have no health. I'm bankrupt in my health." And so it's, it's the big swap. I hear it all the time. And what I want the listeners to understand is that you don't have to exchange one for the other. You can do both. So that's the first place to start is realize that you can make deposits in two fronts at the same time. And I, I kind of think of it as a railroad track. If you're laying one rail, you're great. And you probably have laid it you know, all the way miles and miles down the road from a monetary standpoint. But this other rail is just built one rail at a time, kind of keeping track with your other one, your money. So that's your health and wealth railroad. And so, so when you look at that, if, if I, if I look back to my own history, you know, I'm the daughter of a financial advisor. I, I entered this industry as 
as a, a third party, I guess, as an 11 year old, right? I'm, f- I'm turning 50 this year. So I watched while my dad built his business through those hustle years, did very well for himself and his health declined. He was the heaviest he'd ever been during those years. He was the most absent from our family. And it was, it was a time that I, I saw it for what it was. And a lot of people need to understand that if they just take small steps now, then you can start to accumulate compounding effects over time. So that's, that's my main thing is look at your life and realize that this is a value of yours. This is something that's worth protecting and it's worth saying no to things for. It's worth putting a deep root in the ground and making things work around you. And I'll give you an example of this. If someone has kids and pets and parents that they're taking care of, those always come first and their health comes last. So I would just encourage everyone listening to say, let your health pull up a seat at the table too. Let it have a voice of you need to do these things and let some things work around you and you work around some things all based on priorities, obviously, and what's needed, but don't let it keep getting put in the back burner. Okay. So that's the first thing. The second thing is just start cutting your day in half. Take, take your 24 hours. You can draw a circle on your paper, cut your day in half and say, half of my day is for recovery. Half of my day is to eat. Okay, so let's say you're going to eat breakfast at nine o'clock. That means you're not going to eat any any more after nine o'clock that night, right? That's a really simple way to start. And it just gives your body's not good at multitasking. It doesn't digest food and repair cells well together at the same time. It needs to do one or the other. So let's give it the opportunity it needs. So feed on half of the day and then fast on the other half of the day. That's a good place to start. And the second place is like map out your day. When are you going to eat your breakfast, lunch, and dinner? Generally speaking, is it 10, 2, and 6 o'clock? Great. Doesn't matter. Pick your times because your stomach has to release acids and it needs to know when you're going to eat. Otherwise, it sends the acids and there's no food and then you're grumbly and complainy and you you have a mental breakdown. So just generally speaking, set your intention around meals. And then the last piece is set your bedtime. I know it's silly. We do this for our kids, but we don't do it for ourselves. When do you intend to get to bed? If it's 11 o'clock, set, a, set an alarm for 10 o'clock and start your wind down at 10 o'clock and, and wake up without an alarm clock the most that you, the, you know, as often as you possibly can. That's where I would start. Once you have those core frameworks built, then you can start working on your exercise or dialing in your nutrition and some of that stuff. But the framework has to exist first. Because you can always insert new tasks, to-dos, tips, tricks, hacks, whatever. But the framework exists whether you're 40 or you're 60 or you have to care for children or your job changes or whatever. You can just rebuild your framework that work- so it works for you. So, so help us understand how you came to this path to be, to be doing this, this kind of work. Well, I, I I alluded to it just a minute ago. It's, you know, my history, it's my DNA, my people. The financial services industry is something I grew up in. I worked in my dad's front office when I was in college. Um, he had a robust business. He, he did very well. And I got to go on lots of trips. I got to go on lots of conferences. I got to see his colleagues. And I, I was shocked, Michael. I was absolutely shocked as a teenager when I could articulate what I was feeling, which was there were a lot of sick people. And there were a lot of people who were having one good year of retirement or dying at the desk. And I, I was like, wait, aren't you guys planning for retirement? As a kid, I, I was like, what? Look, but then you're not getting to do what you want to do? I thought you wanted to travel. I thought you wanted to take up whatever sport but then they can't. And so then when I worked in the front office, I saw the same things from the clients. We would, we would celebrate their retirements. We would celebrate their weddings. You know, we, you become a part of the family when, when you're in a small community as an advisor and to see these people suffer. So, and not get what they had worked for decades to be able to enjoy really hit me hard. And so after I graduated, my dad's like, I think you'd be good in this business. And it's one of those things where 
Should I have done it? Maybe. Would I have been very well off and had a great gravy career? Maybe. But I couldn't do it. I was like, it's, it's not the system that I can feel good about. So I chose not to go into the industry because of what I saw and the health of my dad and how hard he had to work and the struggle and the stress and, and then the result of these retirements. And I was like, I'm going to go fix this. And so I became an exercise physiologist. And I, I, I went and did what I now see as being the other asset, this other piece that we have to have for retirement. And the, um, the research is out there, Michael. I don't know if you've seen the age wave research. Um, Merrill Lynch did some in 2014. Edward Jones did some in 2021. And the research is where they talk to retirees and say, what is, what is a good retirement? And across all these metrics, stress, financial worry, early retirements that were unplanned, like all of these, it's health, health care, health crisis. It's always in the top of the reasons people either enjoy or don't enjoy what's going on in retirement. And so it's, it's a very integral part here. It, d- it took me 20 years to figure it out, though. Honestly, I was, I was doing the whole like exercise more, get in your cardio zone. You need to do three times a week. Like I was that person. And I, it was when I almost died in Australia um, and we're going on probably 10 years now. I almost died there. I had to have an emergency surgery. I was septic. I had to have a blood transfusion. It was horrible. I almost, uh, you know, didn't get to see my family again. We were living across the other side of the world. And fortunately I, I did make it. But overnight, the five days I was in the hospital, my body aged a decade. I lost so much muscle mass. I lost all my gut biome, all the flora fauna from the antibiotics I was on. I had a completely different body when I woke up out of that surgery. And it was that event that said, whoa, what is actual health? It's not exercise. Is exercise exercise a part of it? Of course. But it's not exercise. It's how you think, it's how you orchestrate your day, it's it's stress, it's sleep, it's repair, it's all of these things. And when I started to look at it, I thought this light bulb moment, I was like, finance and health are identical. The parallels that you that you subscribe to to be successful financially are the same ones for health. It's small deposits, long-term mindset, and it's the other wealth. It's W E L L. It's abundance of, of this asset. And so that's, that's when grow wealthy was born was from the two worlds that I lived in collided on that day. And, and so what is, what is your actual business? (laughs) What do you do at this point with this? Yeah. So I, I run grow wealthy and grow wealthy is helping people to have, um, better health. So we take that score sheet, we assess, we make tweaks, and I coach financial advisors to be as healthy as they are wealthy and to have the retirement that they're looking for with their health as a partner in that process. So we we essentially, we work together for six weeks and we we say, okay, here's the concepts that we're going to apply. Here's the frameworks we're going to use. Where are your biggest gaps? We find the tools for those and we watch magic happen and we turn their health around. That's what we do. After six weeks, they have the blueprint. They have what's called a wealth plan that they can take and run with, or they can stay in our community and they can execute on it together with us, where we've got several dozen advisors who are colleagues, peers. They, they help each other in this process. So it's, it's, a, it's a, a behavioral change coaching around health and wellness from a financial perspective. So can you, can you go a little deeper with us of just what what's the six-week process like what's happening over this six week time period what am i what am i doing as an yeah. advisor yeah for sure so advisors come in and first thing we do is uh, goals tools and metrics so we assess that we gather all the data we get all the tech in place and we look for the data we we analyze it once we have the data we start to create some goals and those goals are based on what the client wants what the blood results say whatever we pick a couple of things and then the next few weeks are going through that pyramid that i told you understanding how we can implement different things from those four levels the mind the mend the 
meals and the movement. And we learn about those concepts and execute on the things that feel right for them and that move the needle for them based on the goals. So for one client, um, he, he might need to do th- these three things and somebody else might need to do a different three things that we figure out that are kind of their core things that they're doing. But it's all based around the same concepts and frameworks. So they, we work together once a week um, in a small group setting or a private setting, depending on what they choose. And then at the end of the six weeks, they have a plan in hand that they they know what to do. It's going to serve them for the next several decades if they choose. Um, and, and they know what to do with it and all makes sense for them. So that's what we're doing is we're, we're learning, we're educating, we're applying and creating their path forward. As you well know, if someone doesn't set a goal financially, whether it's for their business or for their retirement or whatever, chances of hitting success are pretty rare, right? You, you talk about success all the time. You ask all of your guests, what does success mean to you? That's what I'm asking my clients. What does health success mean for you? And it's different for everybody. It's, it's, being able to hike 14,000 foot mountains for some is being able to get on the floor and play with their dog for others. Like it's lots of different things, but we have to understand it and work backwards from those goals with a plan in mind. And that's, that's where financial planning and health planning are very similar. Nobody does it though. Nobody does. Everybody goes to the gym. They maybe lift weights or try to get a little heavier weight, but they don't have a comprehensive approach to all of these metrics to keep their their wellness wheel very round. Well, I guess that gets back to some of your comments earlier that you know when we were talking about like what are the what are the big ROI activities? Or right? you weren't necessarily talking about what I feel like is sort of traditional in the quote get healthier frame, which is essentially like eat 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 less fats and exercise more. <laughs> you know, you were talking about like just cut your day in half of like the eating half of the day and the recovery half of the day, right? Mm-hmm. Essentially is like, don't, don't snack after, <laughs> after dark. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, being more intentional around your bedtime and when you go to sleep, uh, just I'm, I'm struck like you're, you're, you're talking about different, somewhat different kinds of things. I feel like what we traditionally hear around uh, health and wellness. It's true. I I am. And in fact, one of my clients I was talking to today, he said, Stephen, the first time I met with you, I expected you to tell me to put down the pizza and stop eating the junk and not snack after dinner and, and exercise more. And he said, I do all of that and I keep gaining weight. And I was waiting for you to tell me that. And you didn't. He said, you came at it from a completely opposite direction that I've never even thought about. And all I had to do was these three things that were not even diet and exercise related. For him, it was drink his water earlier in the day and be try to be mostly done by two o'clock for him because he was getting up in the night to go to the bathroom too much and it was disrupting his sleep. Something as simple as that. And then it was um, turn off the blue lights an hour before bed. And I can't remember what the other one was that he like, but that's that's him. That's his unique things. But the process helps us find the things for you, for each individual person, because you are, you are unique. And we, so, so when he employed these three things, he's lost 40 pounds and it's been three months or something. I don't know exactly what it's been, but, um, and it was so easy because he was already doing the eat, eat well, exercise more. He's already doing that. He's like, what else have you got for me? And I'm like, we're not even starting there. We're starting down here on the bottom of this pyramid and poof, it all started to work immediately. So that that's the piece. It's like the missing piece of the puzzle gets you that, that 20% gets you 80% of the, pro- of the results. So, so can you just give us, I guess, just more examples? Like just what are the other things? Sure. Well, there, I mean, there are five pathways to health. So I'll see if I can remember them off the cuff here, but one of them is to control your glucose, your blood sugar. So there are lots of ways that you can control your blood sugar, but if it's spiking and valleying throughout the day, you're on a roller coaster and you're going to crave sugar and eating and overeat and you know, you're going to feel like, oh, I just can't stop eating or I want this all the time or I only think about food. So we have to control the blood sugar. Um, and really, honestly, the reason that we want to control blood sugar is because insulin has to show up and insulin is a storing hormone. It stores fat. 
It's the signaler that says, take any extra and throw it into storage. We don't want that around, right? So that's a key pathway to health is controlling that. One of the ways that's really simple. Yeah, you had a question? No, I'd say it's like, so what do I do? Yeah, yeah. (laughs) One of the ways to control your blood sugar is go get the book, Glucose Revolution by Jessie, and I'm going to butcher her last name, in Sapache or something like that, Glucose Revolution. And she gives you 10 hacks that will help you stabilize your blood sugar. Do you have to do all 10? No. Pick a couple of them and employ those and see how it works for you. But one of them is to move after you eat. So if you have lunch, go for a 15-minute walk after lunch, and you will cut your blood sugar spike in half. That's huge. And you only have to walk at 1.2 miles per hour, which is basically saying you just have to stroll. It doesn't have to be anything big deal. You just need to burn off that sugar before it goes into storage, essentially. So that's one example. Another example is to eat your fibers and your green stuff first. So have a salad before you have your steak. And just doing that one thing or eat broccoli before you eat your pasta is going to stabilize your blood sugar just because of the way that your stomach empties and what it has to do for a second and third. Very simple hack you can do. Oh, so that, that's literally just a, a, a sequencing thing yeah. for order just, into the stomach and or, order of processing. So, yes. so I, eat, I eat my fibers and my greens before I eat my proteins and my carbs. Yeah. You would and and you would actually eat it fibers and greens first, then you would eat your proteins and fats and finish up with any carbs like a piece of fruit or your bread. So imagine going to a restaurant, Michael, and they're like, they bring out the bread bowl first, right? Yeah. That's the opposite. I was just thinking, you're like, so basically what you said is like, <laughs> stop eating the bread bowl first. First. You can have it, just eat it last. So when you sit down, one of the, the things you can do is just set the mood, like tell the waitress or waiter, please don't bring the bed bread bowl first, bring it at the end. And can you bring us some salads to get started? And boom, you've just, you've just corrected your blood sugar with a very little small tweak. You can still have the bread. You don't have to not have it. If you want it at the end, chances are you might not want it still, but that's okay. Give yourself permission if you do still want it. So yeah, the order that you eat it in is very, very important for blood sugar. So those are just a couple. The second pathway to health is um, metabolic flexibility. And for those not familiar with metabolic flexibility, it's what fuel source does your body use? to think, move, you know, be alive. And I'm going to bet, unless you're on keto, a keto diet, I'm going to bet that most people are burning sugars as their primary source of fuel. That's carbohydrates and sugars and things like that. If you are on a keto diet, you probably have a primary source of fat burning, right? So if we think about this as like a car, it would be your electric car, is going to be your sugar burners, your your carbohydrate users, and then your gas cars are going to be your your keto people, like a long burn, slow burn, right? But what we want is we don't want either one of those. We want a hybrid car. That's what metabolic flexibility is. It's can your body, does it know how and have the enzyme capability to burn fats when it needs to? and sugars when it needs to without going into a coma or gaining a bunch of weight or, you know, being hangry or whatever. And cutting your day in half, like I mentioned earlier, is one way to start training your body how to do that. So let's say, for example, you take a test. You're like, am I a sugar burner or a fat burner? I don't know. Try skipping dinner one day and just see see how your mood changes. If you're mostly okay, and you're a little hungry, but it's not that big of a deal, you're probably okay and your body knows how to tap into fat as a fuel source. The opposite is that you can eat two Pop-Tarts, and if, it, if you have to crawl under the table and go into a coma, your body probably doesn't know how to burn carbohydrates very well. Mm-hmm. So you can just do a quick test and just be like, oh, you know, which one am I and which one do I need to work okay. on? And timing your day, remember I said set your meals, cut your day in half, get your circadian rhythm. All of that is for this very reason. It's for blood sugar and metabolic flexibility. Is this too much nerdy stuff? No, this is fantastic. So keep me going. Like what's my, what's my, well, I guess anything else on, 
um, metabolic flexibility or, or are we going to, to pathway number three now? We can move on to pathway number three. Um, All right. So pathway number three is cardiovascular or oxygen utilization. We'll call it that. Ox- how your body uses oxygen. And that is related to how strong and efficient your heart and lungs are. And so let's say somebody goes for a walk uphill and they start breathing heavy right away. They probably don't use oxygen very well. Their cells are not adapted to that. If someone can run a marathon and still talk, you know, they're very well adapted and have strong heart and lungs. So we want to have a strong heart and lungs because if you don't, your heart beats really fast. It doesn't move very much oxygen around your body or blood around your body very well. And it, it is not efficient over time. You're not capable of doing the things that you want to do running up a flight of stairs, catching the bus, climbing the mountain, playing with the grandkids in the back with soccer, whatever. Like you're just not going to be capable to do that stuff. So that is a pathway to health as well. And and more so than any of that is we're finding the link between all of these and brain health, dementia, Alzheimer's to be incredibly linked together. So what was interesting when I interviewed these 507 advisors is a lot of them are afraid of losing their mental capacities. It's a real fear for them that they're going to slow down or not be as quick or good yeah. with numbers or whatever. Well, we're, and we're we're in the we're in the thinking and talk uh, you know, talk me quick on our feet business. It's, yes. it's really scary to not not have brain capacity. It is. Uh, when you're in the in the knowledge business. Absolutely. So you want to keep your brain sharp and your dementia is being called now the type three diabetes. Why? Because it's directly linked with blood sugar and your body's ability to use fuels for your brain that are good for it and insulin resistance in the brain. So being able to utilize oxygen to not have too much sugar, not too much insulin, all of that directly affects your cognitive abilities over time as well. So anyway, that's the next one. And to, to do that, you know, those are things like making sure that you're getting out of breath sometimes throughout the day. It can, it can be a long walk, a Peloton ride. Oh my gosh, Michael, I cannot believe how many advisors have Peloton bikes. It's like a thing. I, I, you told me about the standard deviation of, of your advisors and, and yeah. goal, goal setting and that uh-huh. thing. It we're we're high be. Peloton users. Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> it so is now I'm just now I'm hearing this morning. It's like so. How many people are listening to this podcast on their Peloton? Yes, it is unreal. If I asked a hundred people on the street if they had a Peloton, maybe one would. You ask a hundred advisors, probably like seventy percent would. Like it's, seriously, it's crazy high number. Um, and second to that, this is a total side note. I'm going down. Second to that is Orange Theory. So if they're not Peloton users, they probably belong to Orange Theory, and it's because it's goals. Orange Theory and Peloton are all about output and goals and relationships and connection with people. It, it makes complete sense, but that's the two that they go to. Okay. <sighs> anyway, <laughs> you're doing a lot of side notes here. Okay, so was that number three, and now we're on number four yeah. for our metabolic or our pathways to health. Okay, um, so our our fourth pathway. Actually, I'm going to skip to our fifth pathway. Our fifth okay. path, and I'll come back. Our fifth pathway is taps and traps and taxes. So it's us getting in our own way and doing things that are sabotaging our health or leaking health out of our health bucket. Right. So it's the things that we are either unconsciously or consciously doing that are like, uh, this is not really helping us. And so I have a whole area where we work on this of being able to change the traps, which are your thoughts. And it's here, I'll give you some examples. Yeah. I don't have time. When things slow down, I'll work on X. I have to finish my plate because if I don't finish my plate of food, it's wasting money doesn't matter. Mm. Like there's so many thought traps out there that are keeping people stuck. Having having grown up in the Sally Struthers, eat all the food on your plate because children are starving in Ethiopia. Absolutely. I I remember that conversation growing up. Oh my gosh. Yes. Yes. Please, advisors, if you are listening, do not force your children to finish the food on their plate. Please don't because that's, I have to undo that work in 30 years. (laughs) 
help them make the, good choices, try new things, but not finish their plate because they're wasting money. Like that, that that's not that doesn't help. Because the problem is you just like you overeat, you stop you, you don't stop eating when you're done eating because you're feeling your obligation of clear your plate. Yeah, you're using a different measure or metric for what is enough for you. And nobody knows. Nobody knows how to gauge their own hunger and fullness cues anymore because they lost that ability many, many years ago in childhood. So we have to reestablish that. We have to say, what does hunger feel like? And am I actually hungry? There's this acronym that I would encourage everyone to write down. It's called HALT. H-A-L-T. So if you feel like you want to eat food, then just self-assess and say, am I hungry? That's H-A. Am I anxious, angry, or annoyed? And I just need to soothe myself. L, am I lonely? Or T, am I tired? All of those can show up as hunger. And you, once you start to recognize the difference, you can then give yourself the thing that it really needs rather than just more chips or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So those thought traps are really important to identify. And once you identify them, you, you're like, oh, I see you. I've, I, you've been talking to me for a long time and I'm going to call BS on this. I know that that's not true and I reject that thought. Now I can move forward and make the choice I really want to make. So are there other common traps? Because just, you know, when, when someone gives you the external perspective, it's a trap. When you just do it, it's like, that's how life works. Like, that's, that's what I do. That's what I know. Like, that's, <laughs> that's, that's how it's supposed to work, right? Like, I, there are probably a lot of people listening where, like, you just mess with their heads around, like, 10, 20, 30, 40 years of living their life as you're supposed to clean your plate. So like, okay, I get it. But you also just like rocked my world and understanding. So yeah, like what, what, what else is in that? What else is in that category of <laughs> I'm doing it wrong and I didn't even know I was doing it wrong until you, you come in and rock my world and reset me. Yeah. Oh, thought traps. Like a lot of people's thought trap is, um, I'll do it Monday or I'll, next meal I'll do better. It's always some point in the future. And it's, it's very convincing because you truly believe that you will, but you don't. You just never do. You, you never catch up to it. So if you hear yourself saying that in your head as a justification, and one of my advisors actually today said this to me. He said, I am a great salesperson. And I can sell myself on anything. (laughs) So recognizing when you're selling yourself on a false truth or something that you really know is not going to happen, no matter how justified it sounds to you, call it what it is. So if you see yourself kicking the can down the road for some future time when you're going to do it, guys, if you're not ready to do it right now, you're not going to be ready to do it then either. It's it's a fact. So if you're ready to do it now, just... Or can do it now. Do and if it. you're not ready to do it now, figure out what it takes to actually be ready to do it now. Yeah, don't because just, you're not gonna, yeah. Don't commit future you who can then <laughs> easily blow it off when future you arrives because future you doesn't feel like doing it either in the future. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> just know that about yourself. You're like, and it's the same when you commit yourself to events. Like, oh yeah, I'll I'll show up for that event that I'm sure I'll want to go when it comes. If you don't want to go right now and can't wait, you don't want to, you're not going to want to go in three weeks when that event happens. Like people overcommit themselves because they think they're going to be different in the future and they're not. They're the same person as right now. So that's another thing. Just call it for what it is. If I'm not going to do it right now and I'm going to kick it to tomorrow, write it on the calendar or be specific so you can at least hold yourself accountable. But it recognizing it is kind of the main thing. And then something I hear often is um, I don't need much sleep. I operate on no sleep. I'm, I'm, I've always been that way. That's just how I'm made. Yep. No, I'm sorry. It's not. It is absolutely. It's how you've, you've been able to get by because you're super smart. You're super capable. You're, you're driven, responsible. Like you've got lots of great attributes, but being able to get by on a little bit of sleep is not one of those attributes. Your body is just, you're just going into deeper and deeper debt. So if you hear yourself say that, call BS on it and say, no, that's not true physiologically. And as you age, you actually need more sleep and it's even harder to get deep in REM sleep. So you really need to incorporate and protect that now while you can. So those are a few of the thought traps. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's just say like I, 
the sleep dynamic strike strikes me in particular. I, I, I went, I went through a round of this as, as well that on the one hand, like I, I, I lived a long, long time of, of you not, not being terribly well slept, but figuring out how to manage to it and, and, and felt like I was fine. And it was, uh, it was getting, it was actually getting a Fitbit and like starting to track this, track my habits on a Fitbit to actually see, uh, to actually be able to see what was going on. And just, I would track, I like, I would go back and look at the Fitbit output of my, uh, like my average hours, it's like average hours slept for the month. Cause you can get these like big roll up uh-huh. numbers of like it averages for the month. And right. you know, in, in, in any particular, uh, month, like I have a fairly stable sleep pattern. Like, you know, a, a good sleeping month was like a 30 minute per month average than a bad sleeping month. Uh, you know, something like seven hours in deep sleep cycles versus six and a half hours in deep sleep cycles. Yeah. Uh, and Every month that was below average, I put on at least two pounds. Oh. And every month that was above average, I dropped weight. Wow. And like for a whole bunch of other habits that I've been trying to go through for years around eating healthier and exercising. And I went back and looked and like the amount of time I spent exercising in the month had no actual relationship to whether I was up or down that month. Mm-mm. It was whether my sleep hours were above or below average. And it wasn't a huge, it wasn't like, the month that I had five hours of sleep because I was traveling a lot back then and like would yeah. have terrible sleep cycles when I was traveling. Uh, just like a 30 minute swing in average sleep averaged out over a month mm-hmm. was enough to materially shift the direction of weight more than how much food I ate, how many calories I tracked, or mm-hmm. how much exercise I got because I was. Fitbit tracking all. Oh my gosh, you just that just gives me goosebumps because you are you have data to prove exactly what we're talking about here is that that level of mend comes before the nutrition and the exercise. It it has to because that's when your body burns through fat. That's when it decides to store it or use it. And and if you're not getting enough, it 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 adds up. So wow, that's amazing. Yeah, it was quite striking. That was not the result I was expecting to, to. to see, but it it was extremely unambiguous look, looking at the data. Yeah. And that's why I love the data that it tells a story. It, it really does. And we can, we can, I call it the three authorities. You've got three of them. One is what science says you should do. The other is what you like and feels good to you. And the <laughs> third is what does your data say? And if all three are saying the same thing, you've got a winner right there. But let's say that, you know, data, science says you should do it, but you hate it. It's not a winner. Or you love it and science, all this research in the world says it's great for you, but you're, you're, <laughs> you're keep gaining weight and the results don't speak for themselves. It's not a winner. Like we have to have congruency between those three authorities for it to work. So, um, and then I wanted to touch on your piece about exercise and weight loss. There are a, a gazillion reasons to exercise. Weight loss is not one of them, and people okay, don't so now understand that. You're messing that. with all of us again. All the <laughs> things we learn, so deprogram us. Yeah, it's it's so ingrained in us that we need to exercise more and eat less to lose weight, and it is absolutely incorrect information. The amount of calories that you burn exercising really hard are minuscule compared to the other things that we're talking about. So, and, and in fact, when you exercise and sometimes too hard, when you exercise, it actually increases your appetite. And so you overeat because of that. And it, it, it's a, you can gain weight exercising very easily because of that. And so that's why we always work on these other pieces first, before we add the exercise in, because it's, it's like, if you listen to Dr. Atia, he says exercise is the most important thing for you to do. And I agree with him. I do not agree, though, that it's the first thing that you do. And there's a difference. One is behavioral. One is physiology. And so if you start with exercise, you're going to rev up your your um, hunger response. You're going to get sore. You're going to have a lot more repair to do because your m- muscles need to, you know, reattach and get the inflammation out and all this other stuff. And if you don't have the routine of sleep, 
and stress control to go with it, you're going to be in a continuous teardown, teardown cycle. So if you're, if you're exercising to lose weight, I would ask you to reassess your goal and your mode of reaching that goal because they're probably not aligned. Because I have to start with the mending sleep side first because that's that's yeah. lower on the pyramid. Yeah, you do. And if that's not in place, the exercise isn't going to get you there. And, and you know, if, if you're, if we think about how fat is burned, you have to unlock it in a sequence. Okay. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a insight into a hierarchy of, well, what do they call it? Order of operations. We'll call it order of operations. Okay. okay so, um, so let's say your body wants to burn, you want to burn some body fat and you're like, I, I've got, you know, too much around my stomach. I need to get rid of some fat. It's time to do something. Okay, great. So you start to exercise and your body's like, oh, we're exercising. Let's use the sugar that's in our bloodstream for that fuel source. Great. Well, mm -hmm. you're like, well, I don't really want to use, I want to use the fat around my stomach. Well, the high, the, the order of operations is that your body will pull from all the sugar in your blood first. And when that is depleted, when there's no more sugar left in your blood, it's going to pull from the next level. And it won't go to the next level until the first level is completely empty. So it unlocks the level. Think like, I don't know, Mario Brothers, you unlock a new level of success or whatever. Like, So you burn through the, the, the sugar in your blood, unlocks the next level, which is stored sugar. And that stored sugar is called glycogen. It lives in your muscles and your liver. It's stored for the emergency when you have to run after, away from the bear or whatever. So then it will use any glycogen stores that you have. And then and only then will it be like, oh, man, I, I, she's still exercising or hasn't eaten yet. Like, we need more energy. Where are we going to get it from? Your body will throw out a craving to go get more food because it's so much easier to burn the sugar than right. it is to go tap into something else. Fat is hard for your body to burn. It takes a, it takes a lot for it to do it. So I like to think of it in money terms. Sugar is the cash in your pocket, easy to spend, right? And then the glycogen, the stored sugar is, is like money in the bank. You can go get it out pretty easy. And then you have to go to this next level, which is the fat in your bloodstream. So if you had a meal in the last few hours, there's some fat in the bloodstream and your body's like, oh, we'll use that, that we can break that down and turn that into what we need. Okay, great. So that's, that's like the next level, maybe your savings account or something, you know, it's a little harder to get to, yeah. but your body's willing to do it. Well, only when that is gone, you've emptied that account, your body's like, oh, really? We have to go get that certificate of deposit out. Like, I don't even know who to call to do that or what to do. And it's just not super accessible until your body knows the pathway and has all the tools in place to do that. So it's, it's that it takes, you have to go through those stages to get to the fat and unlock that to use that as your fuel source. Most people never get there. They just go eat another meal, have a snack, grab some grapes, eat a cookie on their way passing through the, the break room, and they're always burning off that sugar and they never have a chance to tap into fat. So that's, again, back to that cut your day in half. Give your body 12 hours to tap into those fat sources and to establish the ability to do that. The other piece of that, we'll just go a little further in this fat fuel thing, is that your body burns the most of its fat storages while you sleep. And so if you're not getting the deep restorative sleep, you never even access, you're not even in the, the realm of being able to unlock the door. You're not even in the room of where the fat storages are. Like it's not possible. So that's why teaching your body metabolic flexibility, eating the right foods, getting the good sleep, it unlocks the doors. Otherwise they stay slammed shut. And you probably have people listening who are like, like one of my clients, I'm exercising harder than I've ever exercised before and eating less than I ever did. I can't lose a pound because the doors are locked. You, you, you're just, if, if your body needs more calories, it's going to go pull from your muscle and in kind of consume itself. It'll pull muscle before it'll pull fat. So that's why we have to do it in a, in a place of peace a place of comfort where your where your body is willing to let go of that fat and it's the right circumstances are established. So anyway, that was a big rabbit trail when we're talking about thoughts and traps and taxes. The the other piece of it, which we, you know, I alerted yeah, to Yeah, then one what was number four since we jumped to taxes and 
uh, yeah. the traps and taxes, then what was the last one? Well, real quick with the traps, because we only talked about thought traps. When it comes to taxes, you've got alcohol, sugar, industrial seed oils, um, sitting too long, staying up too late at night past midnight, eating out too much. Like those are all taxes that are, if you do have good health, they're leaching health from you. So I call it a high tax bracket. You've got the money, but you're getting taxed like crazy for it. So that's something that so what, we So what are the things in there? So alcohol. Sugar. That, that trombone sound. Sugar. Yeah. <laughs> Staying up too late. Yeah. Eating out. Eating, eating out too much. Mm-hmm. And what, what else was in Sitting there? still for long mm-hmm. hours. Okay. Because, you know, we don't do that. Right. <laughs> Emails and financial plans and analyses and like exactly two, three, four client meetings in a day. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it takes like you can turn all these switches back on with one minute of movement, guys. It's not a big deal. All you have to do is almost like touching the screen of your cell phone when it goes dark. Just touch the screen. Get up, move around a little bit, do a walk and talk, like do something for at least a minute and then go sit back down again. You'll keep all your systems operating that way. So, okay. So we need to go back to the other one, which yeah. was uh, the other pathway to health, which is around your muscle and joint function. So right. it's maintaining muscle and joint function. And that's just your ability to move your body in space and time. Um, and so I told you earlier that every year after age 40, you lose muscle mass at a rate of 6 to 14% depending on what your activities are. So if you are doing nothing, you're going to lose more muscle mass quicker at closer to the 14%. If you're doing something, you're going to lose your muscle mass slower. So we want to slow that down. I call it inflation. It's basically your, your, your money's getting taken. Things are more expensive. So, so this, this process is how can we slow that and have a plan in place for it? And how can we maintain our function? So, as you've gone on this journey in, in, in bringing this to the advisor community, I'm curious from, from your own path, what, what surprised you the most about trying to build a, a consulting business around actually doing this and helping advisors with it? Well, first of all, I had to get over myself and I had to realize that I didn't know anything and I had to learn a lot of new skills. Like that was a big thing. Um, it's not easy as everyone listening knows who's running their business or growing a practice. It's not easy to, to be the jack of all trades and to learn the marketing piece and the tech stack and, you know, all of that stuff. But even further to that, what I thought I used to know really wasn't true. What I learned in my master's degree, all my certifications, everything wasn't what really was happening. So I had to trust myself to go find the new research and apply that stuff that I knew was working, not stick with the old. Like you said to me, you're, you're telling me stuff I haven't really heard here. Like this is not stuff everybody's talking about in the nutrition world or the exercise world. There's a reason for that because I had to go find the new information and trust myself that this is, this is the new path forward. So that, that, those are some big hurdles I came to. The, the, The third one I would say is how do you tell numbers people that their health is important (laughs) Uh and and how do you educate and tell people like there's not a burning fire here until you have a heart attack of course or something like that but like how do you teach people to prevent what's coming and it's the same conundrum that advisors find themselves in how do you teach a 30 year old that they need to start saving for retirement it's there's not a problem yet right yeah that's hard given our planning orientation i'll admit that the the piece of that that stuck with me as you were talking about it is this whole like if i want to if i want to make deposits to be in good health in retirement that just as we tell clients like you have to start saving early and it's so much easier when you save early and like mm-hmm. we've all in advisor world seen some version of the charts or made some version of the charts where like here's how much you have to save if you start at 55 and then here's how much less if you start at 45 and here's how much less you start at 35 and like look at how little it takes to accumulate your retirement if you just start at 25 like that that yeah. mental image is pretty well ingrained for me in in financial yeah. advisor world so i'm just thinking like that but the end point is your health in retirement and it's the same start earlier longer and if you haven't started that's not good but the only better time to start than yesterday is to at least start today because it exactly. only takes more 
if you wait from here. Yes. You know, and it's funny because when I when I'm coaching my advisor clients and we're talking about their their quote spending or how they're allocating their whether it's their food or their movement or their time or whatever to create the goals that they're looking for, one of my one of my best tactics if if anybody here ever works with me, you'll recognize this in the future. But um I'm giving away my secret here, but one of my best tactics is what would what advice would you give to your client if they were overspending to the goals that they had told you that they wanted? And and this light bulb goes off. They're like oh my gosh, these two worlds are exact. I always wonder like why my clients are making this choice or this decision or why they're not seeing the big picture or the long-term goal. And as soon as they see that in their health and and connect those dots, it's it's Mm -hmm. this light bulb and they they can then begin to coach themselves through this process. And because it's the same, I am the financial advisor. I just have a different asset I work with. It's, it's just health instead of dollars. And it's, but it's for the same goal, the same reason that the advisors are working with their clients right now. So what was the low point for you on this journey? Probably my low point was when I realized that, and maybe it's a high point too, as I think about it, was that I can't do it by myself. I can't so be good happened, at everything. what happens that you hit that wall? Um, it, it was me violating my own principles. So when I saw myself starting my, my own heart rate variability start to go uh, down or my own metrics starting to change in a way that I didn't appreciate, um, I was like, this is not a sustainable situation that I'm in and I, I'm not able to do this by myself. And so part of that is ego saying, I should be able to do this all by myself and Mm -hmm. take care of my clients and run the business and take care of me and my kids and, you know, all this other stuff. And then, so that was like a low point. Like I'm, I'm broken. I can't do it. Something's wrong with me. Why is everybody else able to run their business and I can't run mine and, and, and have this balance per se, or whatever you want to call it, this equilibrium of, of life in general. And, but then at the same time, that was the pain point that got me to say, I don't have to do it all. I can pull an expert in for this marketing piece or this digital, whatever, whatever, and, and get the support that I need. I can, I can align myself with other people who are doing what I'm doing and learn from them and become part of a community. And, um, and then you realize that they're struggling too, and they're looking for help, maybe not in the areas you are, but you can't do everything perfectly. And, uh, it, something's going to give, I was at, I was speaking at this event in, um, it was an FPA event in Atlanta a year or two ago. And someone recommended this book to me, choose your cheat. Have you heard of it? I don't, I don't know this one. Yes. And so this, what is choose your cheat. Yeah. The premise of the book is you can't do everything to the level that you want to do it at. It's not possible. So you might as well choose the thing you're going to cheat on or AKA not do as well on. Uh, okay. Yep. Or it's going to choose you and you're going to yep. not, you're going to be regretting some things. So whether it's relationship, kids, money, career, like health, you have to have a certain level of like choosing your own destiny of what things you're going to let slide on purpose and which things you're going to really focus on and which things you're going to be okay with mediocre on. Yep. And that was one thing I did talk to those advisors at that call at at that event was I was like, if you don't take anything from what I'm saying here, the one thing I would love for you to at least do is examine your life. And I think that um, in the advisor world, it's very easy to keep shooting for the next AUM, the next level, the next partner, the next scalability of whatever. And sometimes we don't recognize the cost of keep that to keep going like when is enough enough and then ask yourself do you have enough in all of your categories or is there something that's a little bit lopsided so what other advice would you give advisors who maybe are are reaching that moment of i've been complacent too long i know some things aren't in a good place anymore yeah i need to do something and I'm and I'm not even sure where to start because there's there's so much that I probably have been neglecting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, a lot of I mean, 
advisors are, they're data people, they're assessors. They, they like to have a problem and a solution and, and, and do that. So that's one of the reasons I created the health credit score quiz. Just okay. go to my website, growwealthy.com right there on the front page. It's, assess yourself. How are you doing? Because the bedrock of what I teach is awareness first, curiosity second. And it's a healthy dose of vitamins A and C, awareness and curiosity. So if you know where you are, face the facts. It's like the person who doesn't want to come into your office and have a financial advisor because they're too embarrassed, right? Um, Come on in, face the facts, and then get curious. Don't self- you know, don't create guilt or say how horrible you are or feel whatever, like just, just assess. And then I wonder what would happen if, and start to ask some questions. And one of them is, you know, pick where, and I call it the dopamine detective. You want to follow where it feels good and is good for you. So you think about, okay, think about those four items that we talked about, exercise, meals, mending, and your mindset, those four, do any of them pique your interest? Because if they do, they're going to give you a dopamine hit in your brain. And we got to follow the dopamine because that's where health is found is in the feel good. And so if you can find something that piques your interest, anything I've said that you're like, Ooh, that's interesting. That's your particular next step. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you what it is because I might say, you know, go for a walk after dinner every night. And you're like, I hate walking. It's freezing cold outside. I'm not doing it. Right. So like, even if it is good, (laughs) yeah. Yeah. So follow the dopamine, let your own curiosity guide you to the next best step for you. Maybe you need some help with that because maybe you don't know all the options available to you. Very cool. So as we wrap up, this is a podcast about success, right? And just, we talked about the whole theme success means different things to different people sometimes it changes for us as we go through through our own lives and so you know you're you're building the successful business around helping advisors with their with their own health and wellness and and provide that as a service to the advisor community mm-hmm. how do you define success for yourself at this point so success has um two words come to mind and I, I, I toggle back and forth because I do think about this often. I toggle back and forth. So I'll give you both of the words and you guys can decide if one fits better than the other. But success to me is choices. And it, it, it's, it's, it's choices, which also equals freedom. And that is success. Nobody wants to be forced to sit on their couch because they have to go to dialysis and can't do the things they want to do. Nobody wants to be forced out of their business because they had a heart attack and they can't get to the office anymore. Nobody wants to be forced to do anything. I talk to advisors all the time who say, I love what I do and I don't ever want to stop. What they don't know is that they may not have a choice in that if they don't take care of their partner in health. And, and that will force the issue to them. So to me, success is the ability to have a choice. Do I want to do this or want to do this? Can I turn the page or not? And not locking yourself into being, being forced into decisions. It's the freedom to move your body. It's the freedom to run your business. It's the freedom to move around the world and live in Portugal if you want to. It's the freedom to make choices. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Stephen, for joining us on the <laughs> Financial Advisor Success Podcast. Want even more ideas, tools, and resources on how to break through to the next level of success as a financial advisor? Check out the leading financial planning industry blog, Nerd's Eye View, at www.kitsis.com, where Michael covers the latest practice management trends and financial planning strategies. And by joining the members section, you can earn IMCA and CFP continuing education credits along with exclusive member content. Get it all now at www.kitsis.com.